teenage soldier killed when an army lorry crashed. His family demand answers about how it happened. A tonic for the NHS, millions of pounds for the region's well-famous heart hospital. But is it a healthy deal for taxpayers? And battling back against the wheelie bins, the war veteran who says there's no place for them in his picturesque village. Hello from Stephen and me. Welcome to the programme. Well, coming up later, a big Anglia Tonight giveaway. We've got thousands of energy-saving light bulbs to give away for free. Plus, staying safe in the summer holidays. A warning to children and parents about the dangers of dens. But first, when teenager Lee Passmore joined the army, his parents knew he would face dangers. But his life ended not on the battlefield, but in a ditch beside the A14 in Suffolk when his army lorry crashed in October 2002. Today his mother heard that Lee may well have died because a brake pipe simply hadn't been connected properly. Simon Newton was at today's inquest and he joins us from Ipswich now. Simon, dreadful tragedy. Well, yes, this is the most difficult of days for Lee Passmore's family and for his army co uh, colleagues. Uh, in the last three quarters of an hour or so, Dr Peter Dean, the greatest Suffolk coroner, has returned what effectively is a neutral verdict, a very unusual verdict. Uh, no clear-cut open verdict or death by misadventure. What instead he's given is a narrative saying that the death of Lee Passmore was due to an air hose being disconnected on the lorry in which he was travelling in and a faulty connection. Also that the fitters who checked that work didn't do their job properly initially and that that uh, mistakes, those mistakes weren't actually detected at any point. Now, for the family, this obviously doesn't give them a clear cut answer as to why or how Lee died, and it doesn't give them anybody to blame, but at least it does give them some reasons, some recommendations that this won't happen again. Susan Passmore arrived at today's hearing in search of answers. Her only son, Lee, joined the Army aged 17 in 2001 and was later posted to 3-8 Regiment Royal Engineers in North Yorkshire. On October 2, 2002, he and two colleagues picked up a Bedford Army lorry from this vehicle repair firm in Colchester. Lee was the passenger. But as they travelled home along the A14, the lorry careered off the road at Claydon, just outside Ipswich, and rolled over twice before ending up in a ditch. The impact was huge. The lorry's cab was crushed just one foot in height, trapping Lee inside. Paramedics tried to save his life, but he died at the scene. For Lee's family from Devon, the grief at losing him is mixed with anger. It's not that easy to get on with your life not after something like this has happened. Um, so, yeah, I'm angry and obviously upset for what they've put me through, for what they've put my daughter through. Um, she's lost a brother and I've lost a son. The lorry driver, Lance Corporal Paul Johnson, survived but remains on crutches. Neither he or Lee were wearing seat belts. At today's inquest at Ipswich Crown Court, a fault in the braking system emerged as the most likely cause of the crash. Inspectors found that a pipe leading to the lorry's air-powered handbrake hadn't been fitted properly and was hanging loose. Vehicle inspector Andrew Purdy said the pipe coming off would have caused the handbrake to come on almost instantly, with one set of wheels locking before the other. Lee's former commanding officer, Captain Stephen Penfold, seen here on the left, told the inquest the lorry was overdue for its army service and there was also no record that work by army mechanics had been double-checked or that inspections had been carried out to the vehicle at all in 2001 or 2002. So, Simon, were the army's maintenance procedures at fault here? Well, the simple answer is yes, they were at fault, but uh, Dr Dean was very keen to stress that those faults didn't necessarily uh, lead to Lee's death, and he was very, very keen to stress throughout this inquest that he was not attributing liability to any one party involved. What he did say, though, at the end, and made a number of recommendations about the Army's procedures, he said that they, uh, the system they had of checking their Army vehicles wasn't appropriate. In this case, the system needed to be addressed and uh, changed, and that the vehicle in which Lee died didn't actually have an MOD certificate which would have made it lawful for it to have been on the road. And what was the family's reaction afterwards? Well, as you saw, Susan Passmore, Lee's mum, was here today. He has a 14-year-old sister as well. His parents are divorced and live down in, uh, in Ilfracombe in Devon. I spoke to her just outside the courtroom here a short while ago, and this is what she had to say. There's no, not one person we can blame. You know, there's obvious mis obviously mistakes all through the MOD. So we can't blame one person, but they do need to change. 
justice system needs to be better so it doesn't happen to other people. Now, the army say that some procedures have been changed uh, after Lee's death. I spoke to the family and asked the obvious question as to whether they were thinking of taking any civil proceedings against the army or any other, any other party involved, and that's a decision that they're currently thinking about. Back to you. Thank you, Simon. Next tonight, almost £250 million is to be invested in two of our region's hospitals. The government has announced that a new state-of-the-art heart and lung centre will be built to replace Papworth in Cambridgeshire. South End Hospital in Essex will also be redeveloped. Most of the work will be done under the controversial private finance initiative. Stuart Leiths has more. Papworth Hospital is already recognised as a centre of excellence for heart and lung medicine. But now the government has given the hospital trust the go-ahead to develop its facilities even further. £148 million will be spent building a new state-of-the-art cardiothoracic treatment centre. It's one of 15 new NHS hospital developments announced by the government today. Papworth isn't just a name that's recognised throughout Cambridge or, or England, but indeed worldwide. So uh, being able to put in something like £150 million uh, to redevelop and give state-of-the-art facilities at Patworth, I think is uh, not only uh, a great announcement for people locally in Cambridge, but people throughout this country. The new hospital could be built on the existing site around 10 miles west of Cambridge, but it seems more likely that it'll be situated alongside Adambrooks Hospital in Cambridge itself. It's been a very long path to get the argument one that this hospital needs big investment. Uh, we're a top hospital internationally. We want to stay there, provide world-class care for all of our patients. And so today's news will enable us to carry that forward. In Essex, South End Hospital will get £100 million to redevelop its site and improve services. The hospital developments are to be funded mainly through private finance initiatives. That means a private company will build the new facilities and the hospital will pay to use them. PFI, which was used to build the new Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital, remains highly controversial. The public services union Unison has criticised PFI. It says that once services are run for profit, the quality of care is reduced and the public service ethos is replaced by a profit motive. As yet, no date has been set for the completion of the new hospital developments. It's now down to the local health organisations to progress the initiatives. But the government has set a target of opening 100 new hospital schemes by 2010. Stuart Leiths, Anglia News. Now, he's faced a few confrontations in his time, but when a council tried to deliver wheelie bins to his home in North Norfolk, old soldier Charles Simeons put up a fight. He didn't want them on his property in the picturesque village of Cly. Now the council has backed down. Malcolm Robertson reports. Charles Simeons enjoys a challenge and has had several of them in his 83 years, taking on the Germans in the Middle East in the Second World War and then a bit of political sparring during his time as MP for Luton in the 70s. The latest is over wheelie bins, and when North Norfolk District Council tried to deliver to his home in Clay, he said no, there wasn't enough room for them. I said they weren't coming on my land, and um, they said, oh yes, they were. And a fellow who looked a bit like Mike Tyson's elder brother, picked a bin up and oh, came at me. I, he didn't charge me, but he, he made his presence felt. And I pushed him back. And then all hell was let loose and the others started putting bins over the wall here. And um, I, I suppose, having got the strength from somewhere, picked them up and put them back again. And then they started throwing them. And I got very worried then. So I departed and <laughs> called the police. The councils apologised to Mr Simeons and agreed to remove the bins, allowing him to continue using refuse bags. But they say they're under increasing pressure to achieve the government's recycling targets and can more easily do so by using wheelie bins, although we'll listen to individual objectors. If there's a reason for them not to have uh, a, a wheelie bin because of health reasons or no space or, <clears throat> you know, a reason that falls within our policy, as we did yesterday, we, we will make a decision. And, uh, you know, the decisions will be made due to the policy. Wheelie bins are a controversial issue in many areas, and here in Cly, they're worried about the impact on this picture postcard holiday village. The whole village is a conservation area. It's in an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's on the heritage coast. It's got every designation you can think of. And um, a load of grey and green bins littering, littering the high street is not going to be very conducive to tourism. 
What's the reaction of those visiting, Clay? They're a bit of an eyesore, <laughs> especially in a small place like this, really. It's, uh, there's so much traffic coming through that, you know, that ain't a very nice thing to look at. The system works OK, but they are very unsightly, you know, particularly sort of if you've got nowhere to put them off the road, you know, sort of uh, right on the edge, it's sort of very unsightly through a very pretty village, particularly like Cly. The bins have just been delivered and will be emptied for the first time on Monday. It seems most people in Clyde are opposed to the idea of wheelie bins, believing they affect the village's beauty and charm. But the campaign for protection of rural England say the important aspect here is that we recycle and it really doesn't matter what the rubbish is collected in. But Charles Simeons has looked into it more closely and he's adamant the wheelie bins shouldn't be here. Malcolm Robertson, Anglia News, Clyde. Well, that's an interesting issue, isn't it? Do you have a wheelie bin at your house? I don't, and actually I'd like one. I mean, the issues in Cly aside, I would find it very handy because I end up with bags and bags uh, of recycled stuff waiting for me to take it to the <laughs> bottle bag. Thank you with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, stay with us on Anglia tonight. We've got thousands of uh, energy-saving light bulbs just like this one here to give away to you for free. All the details on that coming up. And in sport, Norwich City play a local derby tonight as their premiership preparation goes on. And we look ahead to a particularly poignant match for Ipswich Town. And good news too for the region's pond life. They're home to some of our rarest creatures. The new campaign to create hundreds of new ponds. First, there's some breaking news tonight. Fire crews are at the scene of a major blaze in Southend. Well, it's at the Westcliff Casino on the seafront. Our reporter Tim Evans is there now. He joins us on the telephone. Tim, tell us what's happening there. Well, Stephen, I can tell you that the worst of the fire is now actually over. Uh, it broke out about 4.20 this afternoon in a kitchen area at the Westcliff Casino on the uh, Westcliff Promenade at uh, South End. Uh, now, fire crews uh, have been at the scene. Uh, they've been uh, fighting the fire with an aerial light platform pouring water onto the roof of the building, which was particularly badly affected. There's no sign of smoke now, and the firefighters are just breaking into the side of the roof at the moment to check that the final remains of the fire have been extinguished. The casinos say that there were a number of people in the building at the time of the fire, but everyone was uh, led safely from the building and no one had to be rescued. And in fact, a short time ago, firefighters did allow uh, staff and uh, guests back into the undamaged part of the casino. The fire service say about 25% of the building has been damaged uh, around a kitchen area, and uh, there are considerable uh, delays for traffic along the seafront in, uh, in South End this evening. Police are turning traffic back either side of the uh, area around the casino. This is Timothy Evans on the seafront in South End. Back now to the studio. Thank you, Tim. Well, some more news in brief now. Police in Norfolk are investigating allegations that three girls were indecently assaulted at a Christian activity centre near Cromer. The children were on a school trip at the Christian Endeavour Centre in Overstrand when the assaults were alleged to have taken place. The girls have spoken to police where they live in Wiltshire and Norfolk police plan to visit them soon. A woman serving in the American Air Force at RAF Lakenheath has been found dead at her home in Bury St Edmunds. 23-year-old Catherine Trevino was a computer maintenance apprentice and had been based in Suffolk for just over a year. She was a member of the 48th Communications Squadron. Suffolk Police and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations are investigating the cause of death. A memorial service will be held at the base on Thursday. Demolition work has started in preparation for a new multi-million pound army barracks at Woodbridge in Suffolk. The new barracks are being built on the site of an old American airbase. They'll be home to the newly formed 23 Engineer Regiment, which is part of 16 Air Assault Brigade. The new facilities will cost £82 million, and it's hoped the accommodation will be ready for the soldiers to move in in two years' time. The Royal Mail have said they're going to take on up to 100 extra staff to improve the postal service in Norwich. According to recent figures, Norwich has the worst postal performance in our region, with less than 90% of first-class mail arriving the day after it's sent. Now it's the time of the year when our youngsters are out and about making the most of the summer holidays. Yes, but today came a dramatic warning, particularly about the dangers of building dens in dry woods and playing with matches. Rebecca Holmes reports. Just one match, and within seconds, this wooden den is a death trap. A minute later, it's engulfed in flames. This demonstration at a recreation ground in Haverhill was a dramatic lesson for youngsters this summer holiday. The key message, really, that we're trying to get across to people is the dangers, particularly of children in the school holidays, building dens in, in areas where it's heavy undergrowth, 
heavily um, trees and a good covering that's going to be dry throughout the summer periods. They start experimenting with matches and lighters um, and they're going to put themselves in a lot of danger. So far this summer hasn't been particularly dry, even so Suffolk Fire Service have had to deal with 37 Heathland fires. But while there are dangers on land, there was the annual warning today about the dangers of the sea. There were plenty enjoying the waves here at Munsley in Norfolk, but inflatables, unpredictable currents and tides all hold hidden perils. For people on beaches, the advice is, first of all, swim where there are red and yellow flags. Those are safety designated areas for swimming. Ask for advice from local uh, lifeguards. Look for advice on signs around the, the beaches. Most beaches these days have some sort of safety signage. Never go alone, go with a friend. Uh, that way, if you do get into trouble, there's somebody to call for help. Back at Haverhill, the fire was out, thanks to the professionals. For the children, a valuable lesson. Not to build dens with, next to trees because it could spread easily, like the fire of London. It will set on fire, it will spread all around, and it will set some and house on fire and it will lose your life and somebody's else. Today was also a message to parents. It might be the school holidays, but you will still need to keep an eye on your children. Rebecca Holmes, Anglia News. Good advice all round. Now, let me tell you about the uh, seasonal lunch today in the Anglia News canteen. Full Christmas turkey job and all the trimmings too and even some crackers. And uh, we still don't know quite why. <laughs> I think someone must like turkey no, I think so. <laughs> Sarah, though, is this a, a warning of some cold weather to come? I certainly hope not. Uh, it's really not, actually. It's actually the opposite. I sat here, I ate that Christmas turkey with a cracker on in the sunshine, needed sun cream, started to burn, had to go inside. It was lovely, but uh, over the next couple of days, it's going to get even warmer and sunnier too. Actually, today has been a very nice day across the region. Region. We did uh, start with some cloud this morning at Braintree in Essex, but on the whole, a lot of us started with some really beautiful sunshine this morning. We've seen a bit of cloud bubbling up through the afternoon, but it's been very, very pleasant. We had highs of 24 Celsius, 75 in Fahrenheit. Not bad at all, Claire. He said it's going to get even warmer. Even warmer. A couple Ooh. of degrees warmer tomorrow, a couple of degrees warmer on Thursday. We might have highs of 26, 27 Celsius, which will help us with our July temperatures, because at the moment we're running about a degree below average in terms of daytime temperatures for the time of year. But, uh, you know, lots of people have been stopping me in the streets saying, oh, the summer's been rubbish. And I just want to remind you that actually, uh, we're doing a lot better than four years ago. This July, not anywhere near as dull or as cold as July 2000 and not as wet as July 2001. So it could all be so, so much worse. I think it's very pleasant, although it's going to get quite warm in the next couple of days. You will need your sunscreen. I'll tell you all about it in a few minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Do you know I missed out on their Christmas lunch? They'd sold out by the time no, I, I arrived. Oh, I was very disappointed. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Never mind. Nowadays, we're all being encouraged to uh, save energy. That's why Anglia is running a campaign called Switched On, all about renewable sources of power and how to use it sensibly. As part of the campaign, we're offering thousands of Anglia Tonight viewers the chance to get one of these energy-saving light bulbs free. Details are coming up. First, though, Philippa Heap reports on how South Cambridgeshire is already ahead of the game. This is the Benden family. They live in a new energy-saving house in Camborne. These solar panels on the roof generate electricity and heat their water, in total providing a quarter of the energy requirements for this family of five. The vent in the conservatory provides a heat exchange system. It channels warm air mixed with cooler air from outside into the rooms inside to provide a controlled atmosphere. In the long run, we should have savings. But, um, I mean, it's, it's healthier. I mean, you've got the, the air in, in the property that is cooler for, for, I mean, my children. I mean, the whole environment is a lot, a lot healthier. The development has only just been finished. The housing association, which own it, says this type of innovation is being encouraged. At the end of the day, it's about the people that live here and trying to find ways of giving them um, you know more efficient ways of living and saving on bills for energy that they use etc is you know most important in terms of the sustainability of the the uh, the buildings and the and the accommodation that's provided for them 
Across the road and the offices for South Cambridgeshire District Council look almost space age. One side is shrouded in metal slats which act as a heat shield. There's no air conditioning in here. Just like the Bendon's house, there's a natural ventilation system. The lights are intelligent. Movement sensors tell them they should be on when those councillors are busy working. And the energy saving doesn't stop there. Up here on the roof, there's three panels of pipes that are all busy basking in the sun. Their job is to absorb the heat, which is then transferred to the building's water supply. But all these gadgets come at a price. This building costs £17 million, but the council says, just like the energy, it's not wasting money either. The savings are there, the cost savings are being realised annually uh, and the payback period is probably something like 15 years so it's, it's not uh, too long a time to, to recoup that additional spend. And they're trying out these energy efficient ideas out in the field. When you wash your hands at the loos in Milton Country Park, the warm water has been heated naturally by panels on the roof. The sun has many millions of years left to burn, so the people of South Cambridge are think using its power is certainly a bright idea. Philip Heap, Anglia News. So if you want to do your best, one of these energy-saving light bulbs could be what you need. They last much longer and they use much less electricity. And we've got thousands to give away, along with a fact pack all about renewable energy. To claim yours, you can call the Anglia Action Team now. Here's the number. It's 01473 217 363. That's 01473 217363. If the lines are busy, and I expect they will be, you can write in to Anglia Action Ipswich IP1 2QA, or you can even send us an email to angliaaction at itv.com. Well, the time now is coming up to 25 past six. You're watching Anglia tonight. At 6.30, it's over to James Mates and Andrea Catherwood in London. Coming up on tonight's ITV Evening News. Mercy killing or murder, the father of a terminally ill boy is charged with killing his son. Plus more trouble for Sven as the FA fails to back him over that affair. The evening news is at half past six. Well, sport next in Norwich City are in pre-season action tonight. The Premiership newcomers are at Cambridge this evening. Ipswich's next pre-season test is tomorrow night. They play host to Newcastle in a testimonial match in memory of their former assistant manager Dale Roberts. Dan O'Hagan reports. It's the return of a legend. The man who took Ipswich to FA and UEFA Cup glory more than two decades ago will be back in familiar surroundings tomorrow night. Bobby Robson, now Sir Bobby, brings his Newcastle side to Portman Road for a testimonial match in memory of Dale Roberts, former town player and assistant manager who died nearly two years ago from cancer. Dale still talked about her, you know, the, the, the staff, whenever we're talking and as footballers do, football people, we tend to reminisce and, and Dale is always welcomed and uh, it, it should be well remembered. I'm sure it'll be a very emotional night. There are lots of recent links between the two clubs, not least the likes of Kieran Dyer, Titus Bramble and Darren Ambrose, all youngsters who grew up under Dale Roberts at Ipswich before joining Newcastle. He was obviously a good coach and obviously sadly he passed away, so um, hopefully we get obviously a full out and uh, get as many fans as we can for Dale Roberts. We seem to be supplying them with players at the moment, so um, I'm sure that Bobby will have a right smile, not to mention Bobby Robson, of course, who, who was England manager um, after Ipswich, so th th there's great links between the club. A large crowd at Portman Road will be the first to see Newcastle star signing Patrick Clivert. He's almost certain to make his debut. This was the reception he got when he signed for the Tynesiders last week. The Blues have already beaten Premiership opposition in the past week. This Dean Bowditch goal sinking Crystal Palace on Saturday. Norwich City continue their pre-season countdown tonight at League Two club Cambridge United. Manager Nigel Worthington happy with their progress so far. I've been delighted at the way it's gone. Yeah, first of all, the players come back in in good shape. We've got them topped up. We've got some excellent work done in Malaysia. Um, two very, very uh, good games, hard games out there so early on in our pre-season. Norwich fans hoping to get a glimpse of Thomas Helveg and trialist Jürgen Macho will be disappointed, though. Helveg's not match fit and Macho is only available for training. Dan O'Hagan, Anglia News. Now, the region's ponds are a lifeline for our wildlife that are all too often neglected. Well, now a new £20,000 project has been launched in Suffolk to look after them, restoring thousands of existing ponds and creating hundreds of new ones. Rebecca Atherstone has been exploring. 
Suffolk has over 20,000 ponds. That's three and a half times more than the national average. It harbours a richness of wildlife and beneath these waters, a world of exciting discoveries. The Suffolk Wildlife Trust have set afloat a project to manage, protect and restore our farmland ponds. Our county is a lifeline for the rare great crested newt, the water vole and rare plants like the lesser marshwort. It's a plant that thrives in this pond on Great Green Common in Burgett near Dis. But as always, saving our landscape costs money. There's money from the Heritage Lottery Fund, but the Trust says another £20,000 is needed to complete the whole project. So they've set up an appeal. In two years we might be able to um, perhaps see another thousand ponds or so, but um, there's a massive task ahead of us and it's, it's just a question of trying to find out what's in as many ponds as possible and then give the appropriate owners the right advice. So what can you spot of note around this pond? Well, we were spoilt for choice. The emperor dragonfly, the largest species of its kind in Britain. A great diving beetle, rarely seen these days. Crucian carp cruising below the surface and toad tadpoles. This is a wonderful hideaway for nature. As soon as you have plants, it creates hiding places. And as soon as you have a good array of different plants like we have here, we've got um, possibly 15 or more different plant species. Um, then you've got a whole load of different niches for a whole load of different creatures to thrive and you get much richer wildlife in the pond in general. For six-year-old Maisie Dawson, this is a world of enchantment. She's fascinated by the fish, loves the bugs, beetles and butterflies. The pond project aims to restore many of our neglected ponds so they can become a stronghold for wildlife once more. Rebecca Atherstone, Anglia News, Burgett. Well, nice and sunny by the pond. Is the sun shining on your lily pad? Let's find out from Sarah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hello, good evening to you again from the weather team. It's been a lovely day across the region. We had a little bit of cloud just bubbling up in through the region during this afternoon, but on the whole, we've kept some good sunny spells. And then when we saw highs of 24 Celsius, 75 in Fahrenheit, not bad really for a July day. Over the next couple of days, we're going to keep the high pressure as well, so it's going to be very pleasant. We're going to see a bit of a warming trend. We're going to pull in some nice clear air from the continent. You can see plenty of cloud is starting to clear off really towards the north towards Scotland and uh, we're going to have plenty of sunshine tomorrow and see the temperatures on the rise as we head towards Thursday. In fact by Thursday we could see highs of 26 maybe even 27 Celsius in the best of the sunshine. Then we've got a bit of a blip really because this area of low pressure and a bit of a front is going to cross the region as we head towards Friday so we're going to have some showery rain on Friday but then the weekend itself is looking pretty good. Through this evening, we've got plenty of sunny spells, a little bit of cloud here and there, but we're going to start to lose the majority of the cloud overnight tonight as we go through. See some clear skies developing and lows of 13, 14 Celsius and a very light wind. We could see some mist patches forming as we head towards dawn. They're going to linger with us first thing tomorrow morning. Mist prevalent in the west of the region and some cloud there too, but some good sunny spells elsewhere and the sunshine spreading to all parts in the afternoon. Highs tomorrow, again, like today, around 23, 24 Celsius, a little bit cooler at the coast, even though it's going to be very sunny there because there is an onshore breeze. Then on Thursday, even warmer still, plenty of sunshine around, highs of 26, might even get a 27 Celsius around the region, but it's starting to feel much more sticky and humid. And that's when we're going to see a bit of a breakdown as we head into Friday. So we're going to start with some cloud and showery rain, but the weekend, as I say, at the moment is looking pretty good indeed. Here comes your pollen count. <laughs> The Pollen Count, sponsored by Benadryl. So good news about the weather, and actually it's fairly good news on the pollen count front too. Tomorrow across the region, we're just going to have moderate pollen counts, and at the coast where we've got that onshore breeze, we'll see low levels there. That's it. Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. Well, now a quick reminder of something coming up tomorrow on Anglia News. Somerville's Walks is back. We've reunited our own John Francis with travel writer Christopher Somerville as part of our Britain on the Move campaign. Every Wednesday, right through the summer, they'll be your guide to some of the region's most beautiful, best-kept secrets. 
Yes, the first of those tomorrow night. Join us for that. In the meantime, don't forget to uh, claim your free light bulbs. I've stashed mine away. Have you? <laughs> That's it from us for tonight, though. Good night. Family tragedy. The father accused of murdering his terminally ill son. Jacob Ragg lived with the daily agony of Hunter Syndrome. Was it a mercy killing? Also tonight, schoolboy killer Alan Pennell gets life for murdering Luke Wormsley. The boy convicted of killing Luke today has some form of life left in front of him, but Luke has none. On the line, could Sven lose his job after the FA fails to back him? and fighting back the village that said no to antisocial behaviour. Good evening.